The Voluntary Hardship Series is brought to you by Masculine Style. You know, I've worked with Tanner, the owner of Masculine Style, as my style coach for over a year now, and the transformation has been nothing short of incredible. In the same way we provide expert strength coaching at Barbell Logic and meeting clients where they are, Tanner is really a kindred spirit in style. He's an expert coach with incredible service, always making you feel heard. And because he's a longtime client of Barbell Logic Online Coaching, he knows how to help you find your own style rather than forcing you into something that you're not. His coaching has absolutely transformed the way I feel and carry myself and the way other people perceive me, whether in person or on video conference calls. It's been one of the best purchases I've made over the past 18 months. You can check him out and you can do that at masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C. That's masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C for a special offer just for Barbell Logic listeners. Again, that's masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I am Scott Hembrick, and I have Matt Reynolds with me today, and we are going to do an episode about are you working hard enough? We talked about this a little bit before we heated the mics up. And so you're missing reps and you're trying to figure out if LP is over. And the three questions are, are you resting enough in between sets and resting enough in general? Like at night, are you sleeping well? Are you eating enough food? Are you taking appropriate weight jumps? Weight jumps. And then we've added another question, which is, how's your testosterone? <laughs> if you're over 40, sure. how's your testosterone? And then the fifth one uh, that we were talking about this morning might be, are you actually working hard enough? Yeah. Yeah. And really, that could be the first question. <laughs> could be. Like, it probably is. You know, sometimes you kind of miss the forest through the trees. And we've now seen several thousand people come through online coaching. And it's pretty clear when you have clients who are willing to get in there and be consistent and grind and work real hard. And when you have clients that just don't, I don't know if they don't know how. I don't know if they've never done anything hard before. The interesting thing is we were talking about some of your clients that obviously work really, really hard in their occupation, in their job, and then they get into the gym and they're kind of scared little mouses. Yeah. And so we got to talk about this. Are you working hard enough? One of the early, back when there was nothing out there on the internet, you were really trying to find information was not as readily available as it is today. And I would find some of these early translated pieces of literature from the Russians, from the Soviets, and the American coaches that are now well-known coaches who follow them or the ones that were kind of in the same pursuit of knowledge. That was really this common theme that I saw was that other countries just worked harder than us. Now, you don't need to go down the massive rabbit hole of like what communism does for athletics while (laughs) <laughs> probably everybody that's listening to this podcast, including us, would agree that communism is a horrible form of government. But damn it, makes people work real hard in athletics now because you're out on the street if you don't. And so, you know, getting that government housing, family living in government housing and getting a decent stipend and better food and good rest and massage and all those sorts of things. So one of the things we noticed when we compared, once we kind of saw what the Eastern Bloc countries were doing compared to the Western world, was those Eastern Bloc guys were just outworking us. They just worked all the time. And you look at the Bulgarian model, those guys still to this day, the Bulgarians train six days, seven days a week, six days a week, twice a day, and they lift essentially to max effort loads on the snatch, the clean and jerk, and either the back squat or front squat every single day. They're working up to like 95% plus. It's really bizarre. So are you working hard enough? You ask a while ago, you know, could I tell one of the stories? Would you like me to do that at this point? I would. I'd like you to tell a story. You know, don't call your client out by name or anything. But I think it's a good example and a perfect microcosm of what we see. We have an exponential number of these people. I mean, there's yeah. tremendous numbers. So this is just a good example. And I'll tell the story as an aggregate of clients I've had. I've had Nikki sends, tends to send me professional people, men in their 40s who aren't terribly athletic, which is like me. And that has kind of become a specialty. So I've gotten a lot of these people. I have 
a bunch of online coaching clients right now. I have some openings, by the way, but I have a bunch and I like all of them. And that has not always been the case. <laughs> sure. And I'll tell kind of a composite story. Middle-aged guy, professional person. This is typically either an engineer, but more often a physician. I've even had them be attorneys, but they're typically professional people. They're up in their head a lot. They come to me. They've taken pretty good care of what they think is good care of themselves, which really means calorie restriction. They're in their fifth decade of calorie restriction, and they're small people. Yep. They're 32-inch waist guys, you know, or maybe smaller, depending on how short they are. So, for example, maybe I'll get a guy that's five foot eight and 140 pounds, and they're conscientious, so they hire me to get started off right with strength training. And they won't eat. This is often the message I get. Oh, I go to lunch with my friends. They can't believe how much food I eat. And I say, your friends don't know eating. You need to eat like me. And after 60 days of LP, they'll have gained two or three pounds. This will be a five foot eight guy at the end of 60 days in LP weighs 143, 144, 145 pounds. So started at 140 and now he's at 145. Yes. And I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. So if you're listening to that and thinking, oh, that's not me. I'm 5'10 and 160. It's you. That's you. Still you. Oh, no, no, that ain't me. I'm 6'1 and 191. Yeah, it's still you. Still you. Sorry. Yeah. And try to get them to eat. And they start failing on squats at something around their body weight. Yeah. Something around their body weight. Uh, for the example. Which is like four weeks four in. Four weeks in, they start missing some squats or their deadlift. Oh, so when I talk to them, I get them on the phone and I talk to them or they're an in-person client and we sit on the bench and we talk about it. They're experiencing things they haven't experienced before. And they process all of these things that they experience as injury or potential injury, right? When you squat something heavy, you have to get tighter and tighter and tighter than you've ever gotten before. You have to contract everything in your body as strongly as you can. And then the barbell is trying to undo that. <laughs> It's trying to undo that. Yep. It puts a lot of stress on the muscles of the lower back, which is not on your spine. They tend to really be focused on what their lower back feels like. They have a somatic obsession. They constantly are paying attention to what their body feels like instead of trusting the programming. You know, if you did 145 for three sets of five and you ate your food, 150 is not going to break your bones. Correct. Right. You need to go in there and you need to do that. You need to do your level damnedest to do three sets of five but they start failing. Yeah, it's interesting. You talk about these guys being professional people. They are conscientious people, as you mentioned. To a fault. Right, to a fault. It's that old saying, it's the paralysis by analysis, right? They just overthink everything. By the way, we get this with our coaches sometimes. You know, I coach a lot of coaches and our coaches will lift and they'll eat, but they have a very difficult time sometimes overthinking minor form corrections, minor form cues, simple programming for themselves personally. They'll be just fine for their own clients, but they just overthink everything for themselves. And so I'll see the same thing, although it, you know, for most of those guys, most of them are at least late intermediate, if not advanced lifters, but they'll do the same thing. I constantly have to make things as simple as possible for them. Like, listen, this is okay. Like, this is what's going on. Don't overthink it and just focus on the cue. But your guys often are the ones who just don't know how to work hard physically. Well, they know how to pull a 105 hour a week at the hospital doing, mm -hmm. doing surgeries, right? So they've done hard things. Yes, it is, but it's not just the hard work. It's also they're up in their head. So they say things like, oh, I did this and now my lower back is really tight. And I'm like, well, what does that really mean? I learned this from you. Take a pin and draw an X on the place that hurts. Send me a picture of that. And then we're going to talk about it. Well, they can't do that. They end up drawing a circle over their whole lower back. <laughs> right, right. And then we talk to them and they can't describe what it is. And I know what it is. Like if you squat heavy, 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 is what's heavy for you. And then you pull heavy, heavy, heavy for you. At the end of that session, when you've got your weight belt on, the place between your tailbone and the bottom of your belt will be so tired, you almost can't sit upright in a chair. Sure, sure. That ain't tight. That's not injury. That's the stress that you needed to then adapt and be stronger. That's the stress they needed. But they experienced that in all of these negative ways. So there's that. And then there's also the, oh, I did three sets of five. I videoed it because I'm going to put it up on True Coach so you can see it. But I watched it first. And I don't think that my form is good enough to put more weight on the bar. Well, right. That's your call. Sure. You know, why'd you hire me? Well, for those guys, do you ever use the like, hey, if I had to have 
hand surgery, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job and perform your hand surgery. I mean, that surely they understand most of your clients have acquired this high end job skill. Right. And they deal with people all the time that don't know shit about their job skill who are probably trying to tell them how to do their job. Sure. And of course, you know, part of it is like we are purely in the service industry, right? Like if you go get hand surgery, who's paying the hand surgeon? Not you. Your insurance company does, right? And so the need for a surgeon, and we're picking on a surgeon specifically, but the need for a surgeon to have exceptional customer service to his clients is not that important, right? A family medical doctor, a general practitioner is a little bit different, but for us, we're purely service. And so we, you got to be real careful about the way you talk in this way to our clients, but that's what's going on. You've got somebody who, it's the same problem I had when I was a strength coach at the high school and the football coach would tell me, this is how you should run the strength program. I go, hold on. I don't tell you what defense to run. And I was a football coach, but I recognized that I was not as knowledgeable of a football coach as the actual football coach was. I would run the defense that he told me to run. If you want to run a 4-3, run a 4-3. If you want, like, whatever, if you want to run a 4-2, run a 4-2. I'll do whatever you want me to run. But in the weight room, you shut your fucking mouth because I got this, right? And it wasn't just me. I had a couple other guys that were all in that weight room that knew. So we've got an issue there for sure. I haven't ever played that card with them. I just normally tell them, you know, that, and this is true. I'm not just saying this. This is true. I'm not going to let my guy or gal, trainee, proceed in weight if their form is less than a B. That's right. Maybe even a B plus. Because I tell you what, if it had to be an A, I'd still be squatting on the bar. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You would have never gone up. But, you know, our max effort sets are never our best ones. So that's fine. So I, I won't let them proceed unless they are doing well enough that I judge that as a professional, having seen thousands and thousands and thousands of sets, that they're going to be okay moving up. Yeah. It is not in our interest to get our clients hurt. No, of course not. It doesn't go well for us as a business to get our clients hurt. And so the reason we only hire expert coaches is because those expert coaches know when it's time to push, when to push a little bit. And that it's okay. And if there's a little bit of loss of back extension on a deadlift because your back is working real hard, especially by the time you get to the fourth or fifth rep and it's really fatigued, then that's okay. Now, if there's a whole bunch of back extension loss and we get massive cat back rounding, yep. I all the time I stop. All right, we've got to be able to do this. We're going to back your weight up a little bit. We're going to try it again. But we see people like that all the time. As a matter of fact, it's probably one of the biggest kind of general complaints from our coaches about some of their individual clients is when the clients just will not do the weight that is prescribed on the software. Yeah. And they prescribe this way and they decided I'm just going to do 30 pounds less because it just felt hard. It felt wrong. It felt, you know. So yeah, let me describe a few of those. If you're one of these people that says, oh, my form kind of broke down and I don't want to move forward. Here's what I'm looking at. If you do a set, particularly early on and you do a set of deadlifts or three sets of five in the squat and everything holds together perfectly. I want to see a little bit of lower back mm -hmm. round, just a tiny bit, not a bunch, but I want to see some in the deadlift, for example. So if I don't see that, I'm going to pile a little extra weight on you. Like I want to see it pull your back just a tiny bit, not hump you up. But if you're keeping your back completely 100% you're able to hold the confirmation of your spine 100% from being in the hole to lock out. It wasn't enough weight. We're trying to find the weak point. We're trying to find the point where the form breaks down. So I will push you a little bit so that your back is doing a little more work. So I'm always going to have you, you know, not on the edge, but pushing your capabilities. Well, know that. Know that my job is, in fact, to stress you. And you're experiencing stresses that you haven't experienced before. And it's my job to... And if you don't have a coach, it's your job to read and learn and listen to this podcast and push yourself past the things that you've done before and into new territory. That's how we get stronger. Yeah. The most simple piece of what we do is understanding that stress recovery adaptation. The stress must be more than it was last time. Yep. We don't make progress until we've stressed our body in a way that it has not been stressed before. And what's interesting is, is that no one will do the bench press for the first time, have really sore pecs, and then decide that they've ruined <laughs> their rotator cuffs and that they need to go have shoulder surgery. Right. Everybody that does a bench press or push-ups or whatever, and their pecs get sore, or somebody, they get, you know, you have a lot of people, very sort of uneducated people who decide they're going to try to get abs. And so one night, they're like, I'm going to do 50 sit-ups before I go to bed. 
right? And then the next day they're like, oh my God, my abs are so sore. They don't think they gave themselves a hernia or that they're internally bleeding. Or, but it's weird how when they feel that same sort of soreness and fatigue in their low back, then they immediately go to, I have sheared my spine into, I have herniated a disc in my back. I have done this. Like, no, you fatigue the muscles. Which is awesome. Which is what exactly what we want. So now your back is going to get stronger. I have one that's interesting that I've seen a lot lately is clients that will miss a rep on their last set of prescribed workout. And then they will send me their second set rather than the last set. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. If you ever miss a rep, I want to see that set. That's where we learn. That's right. I can learn so much more about where the fail point is, where the weak point is. What's the thing that broke down? Is it a, was the weight just too heavy or was there a form breakdown? That's a massive, really important question. I say it all the time when I'm, I'm breaking down videos for my clients. Like, okay, you missed this rep. This was because on that press, you threw the bar forward. Well, that's a form problem. But if the form is correct and the weight just didn't go, then it's just the weight was too heavy, right? And that's okay. Or they didn't know how to push on it. Right. That's right. So they'll say, my form needs to be better. Let me just stay at this weight until I can move it with perfect form. And then we'll go on. No, no, that doesn't work that way. You'll never adapt to that weight and you'll never be able to move it with perfect form. And if a 150 pound squat is your problem today, you won't be able to squat it perfectly until maybe you squat 225. That's right. And then 225 is not going to look good. And then 225 is going to look just like your 150 did, probably. And then the other important thing to understand there on, on all of the lifts is that it's very rare that the weakest point of the lift is either at the beginning or the end of the lift. It's usually somewhere in the middle of the lift. And so especially you'll see this with something like the deadlift where somebody will start to they'll get the weight off the ground. And for most people, not everybody, but for most people, the weakest point of the lift is four or five inches below the knee. That also might be four or five inches off of the ground. So the weight will break off the ground and then the leverage is actually a little bit worse and you get to a point where there's, you don't have that tightness that you had when you set up the deadlift at the bottom and you lose all that tightness. But, and then once the weight gets above the knees, the moment arms change and become much shorter and you're usually able to, usually you're able to lock out the weight. So again, this is kind of a bell curve discussion, but there's somewhere there in the middle that's harder than everything else. And so they'll pull that weight off the ground and it gets harder after two or three inches. And you'll see people that weight comes off the ground just fine. It's still moving up, but it slows down a little bit. And like, oh shit, it got too hard. Boom, set it down. Yep. Because I think that the hardest part of the lift is at the bottom. And once it starts moving, it should just continually get easier. And it doesn't. No. It gets harder in the middle. Usually, and sometimes it's harder, man, for me, my bench press, I've always missed my bench presses at the top. My tricep lockout, my elbow extenders are the weak point. And so I've got to like really work that lockout, 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 lockout. It doesn't always get easier. And so we have to learn how to push through the sticking point. And then as you start to become more advanced or down the kind of intermediate line, that's how we start to pick those supplemental lifts as we find like, okay, well, by that time, I have seen you miss enough reps. And I trust that you missed it. Or I've seen you grind on enough reps that I know the spot that needs to be worked. And that's when we start picking things like rack pulls, deficit deadlifts, right? Tempo squats, box squats, floor presses. Don't get us off this early LP problem. Yeah, no, you're right. This is an early LP problem. The early LP problem is, and here's the problem for us as a coach with the early LP. If you don't ever let me see where the problem is, I can't fix it. Yeah. So people who will not grind, who will not work hard enough, who will not eat, who get in there and they're missing reps because they don't know how to work hard in the gym, never give me anything to see. It's like taking your car that every once in a while has a problem and you take it to the mechanic and it just won't do the thing. Yeah. And the mechanic's like, man, I don't know what to fix because it's not doing the thing, right? Well, it's the same thing here. Like if somebody, you see this all the time, somebody descends in the squat and they just start to come up out of the hole and like, nope, and they set it on the pins. Like, dude, I don't know what to coach there. Well, I mean, I do. What to coach there is between your ears. It's not physical. Yeah. Yeah. So let me talk some more about that. I'll have a guy early in LP with a literally like 140 pound squat, a 135 pound squat, and that'll happen. They go five, five, four. Yep. They didn't fade on their second set. And one, two, three, and four of the third set look pretty darn good. And they come up out of the hole on the fifth one, and then they park it on the pins. I will often have those people go up and wait anyway. Yeah, me too. They're like, oh, but I didn't get three sets of five on the last one. Yeah, but the reason you didn't is because just frankly, just because you didn't. Because you gave up. You gave up. And so here's what I want people to know. 
When the barbell's on your back and it's your heavy, your sense of time decays. <laughs> you don't know how long anything takes. That's right. You know, and so when you think that you've pushed as hard as you could, one, there's probably some more pushing power that you can call on. You can probably push harder than you thought you were. And then two, you think, gosh, I pushed against that barbell for a good two seconds. It was maybe instantaneous. You hit the hard spot and you pushed for just uh, a moment and then you set it down. You need to give yourself a legit five seconds of push. If you go back and listen to our episode, Embracing the Grind, I refer people to it all the time. We talk about making sure that you give an all-out effort for a full five seconds. Most hard reps will lock out in five seconds unless they're just too darn heavy. That's right. And for a person in early LP, when you're making the reasonable weight jumps and you're eating properly, you're not going to run into one that you can't lock out. So that full five seconds, which is one chimichanga, two chimichanga, three chimichanga, four chimichanga, five, won't get you to lock out almost anything. And you may need to call your kid out there and have them count it for you. That's right. Because we don't know. I was out there doing that stuff not too many years ago. That's right. And my wife would have to count for me and I would have to count for her too. Because we don't know what that feels like. Time collapses when the barbell's on your back. That's right. So know that your brain that you rely on every day at work ain't worth a shit for this. Yep. Yep. You have to turn into a plow mule when you're in the gym. You don't think, you only do. Yep. And you trust in the process. And if you have a coach, you trust the coach. And if you don't have a coach, you're going to read about LP. You're going to write down, okay, I squatted 155. I squatted 205 for three sets of five Monday. I'm squatting 210 today. I can do that. That's the right weight jump. It's the right program. I ate, I slept, I can do it. And then don't give yourself an opportunity to not do it. That's right. Yeah, because you can do it. You can do it. It's not even about working hard. You can do it. You know, if you've been lifting for a while, you've probably made significant changes to your body. Good changes, positive changes. And after changing your build, your old clothes aren't gonna fit anymore. And if you just buy new sizes of the same thing, you'll minimize the effect of how much you've transformed. By improving your style, especially in the middle of your fitness journey, you give yourself a mental win and get to see a whole new version of yourself in the mirror. And this helps solidify in your own mind that you're making progress and that you'll be at your target strength and build before you know it. So whatever the reasons were that you started to lift, you've likely found other unexpected benefits, improvements to your mental health, your relationships, your energy levels, and your self-respect. Thankfully, getting stronger isn't the only way to level up in all those other aspects of your life, and improving your style, I've personally found, will help compound all the progress you've made with your strength training. Coach Tanner at Masculine Style can help you with those steps. Coach Tanner has been my coach. He's the owner of Masculine Style and longtime Barbell Logic online coaching client. He's helped me for about 18 months now and just completely transformed my style. Not trying to make me something I'm not, but to actually feel more comfortable in exactly who I am. And so it's been a tremendous benefit to me, the way I carry myself, the way I feel about myself, which is more important to me, even than the way other people perceive me, but even the way other people perceive me has, I think, changed and transformed dramatically over the last year and a half, just by the way I carry myself and the way I dress. And so it's more than just clothes. It's a mindset. It's a lifestyle. And we're thankful for Masculine Style, for Coach Tanner, for supporting the Voluntary Hardship Series. Go and check him out. He is an expert coach that is a kindred spirit to what we do at Barbell Logic. He focuses on service and high touch, one-on-one -on -one coaching with his clients. This isn't something where you're thrown into a class, but he spends lots of time with his clients. And it's been absolutely one of the best purchases I've made over the past year and a half. You can check him out. He's got a special deal just for Barbell Logic listeners at masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C. That's masculine-style.com slash B-L-O-C. It's time to level up your style. You spent all this time getting stronger, carrying yourself better, changing your body. Now it's time to bring the style up to the same standards as your strength. Masculine-style.com slash BLOC. So have you ever heard of the Navy SEALs 40% rule? Have you heard that their quote about this? I don't know. So Navy SEALs, I think we would all agree, are probably some of the most mentally tough human beings 
to live. Those guys in Delta Force, right? Those are the the Navy SEAL 40% rule. They've got this rule that they say that when your mind tells you you're done, you're actually only 40% done. And of course, that's not an actual mathematical equation. It's their way of saying like your mind will tell you to quit way before your body is ready to give up. Mm -hmm. And if you look at these guys that have done really well, like in the CrossFit games, like the actual competitive CrossFit guys, the Matt Frazier's and the Rich Fronings and guys like that, they just dominate everybody else. It's that they just don't ever quit. Let me be clear. We're not trying to overtrain people. We're not trying to get you no. to grind on 365 pounds every single workout all the time. No. That's not right. That's why we did an episode early on where we, we wanted to clarify that stuff. But if you've never learned how to grind at all, if you've never learned how to not give up in the weight room, you have to learn that lesson. And listen, that lesson's coming early. It's not coming six months in. That lesson is probably coming four to eight weeks in, right? It's coming four weeks in if you won't eat. If you're one of Scott's clients who won't eat, who weighs 140 pounds and four weeks in weighs 141.5 or 142, it's going to come at four weeks in. And if you're somebody who will actually eat, it's going to come eight weeks in. But at some point, every single person in this process of getting strong, they're going to have to learn that your mind is actually the weakest point. Yeah, that's And right. that your body will continue to work even when your mind thinks it can't anymore and it's done, right? Like we've all been there. Yeah, everybody's done that weird, you know, you took that hike, Colorado, that was at, you know, 14,000 feet, 10,000, probably not 14,000 because that'd be real cold. But, you know, you're at way high elevation and you're like, oh, I can do a three mile hike. Like how hard is that thing? Right. And then you get like halfway through it or two thirds of the way through it and you're like, oh my God, I can't, I actually can't. Not only can I not finish the climb, I don't think I can turn around and come back downhill. I'm done. <laughs> you got to do and it. And you just got to put one foot in front of the other and do the thing and you'll do it. Most people have an experience like that in their life. My hardest people I've ever trained, I don't know that I've ever trained anybody like this online, but in person, and I've told some stories like this before, I've had several clients who had literally never done anything hard in their whole life. School was never hard. Marriage was never hard. They never gave birth. They never, like, you know, they never experienced any sort of tragedy in their life. They never been in a bad car accident. They had never, you know, mowed lawns as a kid. And so the first hard thing they had ever done in their life was in the weight room. Well, you're talking about hard to help them understand what it's like to keep pushing with your body when your mind thinks it's done. And that Navy SEAL rule, again, it's not that 40% number is just a number they picked out. But they basically said, look, when your mind says you can't go any further, you just keep going. I'm fascinated by the guys that run like ultra marathons. I don't want to run an ultra marathon. I don't want my clients to run an ultra marathon. But there's something in their head that says, I'm just going to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah. You know their mind has to tell them that they have learned their mind will tell them, you got to stop. You can't do this anymore. Or Jillian Ward, you can go listen to the episode with her where she talks about setting these world records yeah. for push-ups and pull-ups. You know, she just says one more. One more rep. One. I have to do one rep now. I have to do one rep now. And then 1,400 reps later, she'll stop. That's right. Because the time is up. Not because she's done, but because the time is up. That's right. You know, and we're not trying to do that. We're trying to finish LP, and we're in mid-LP often for these people. I think that they rely on their minds. I think that the common denominator of people that fail mid-LP, not late LP, mid-LP, is they rely on their minds for a living. Mm. And they've come to trust their mind. This is not that. Yeah. And we have a process. And I think that the key for those people is learn enough about the process well, to know what it is, and then trust that process, then you execute on it. Yeah. And don't think about it. Once you unrock the bar, but actually before you even go put your shoes on that day, you just look at your book and you're like, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And we're not talking about at the end of LP. I'm not talking about, oh, should I reset and make another run at it and try to get five more pounds on my squat at the end of LP? That's not what I'm saying. Right. That's a different episode. That this is, for men, people always want to hear numbers. That's always a danger. But I'd say for men under 50, if you're failing on your squat under 250, it's probably up in your head. And for ladies, I'm not as good at getting those numbers for ladies having as much experience. Or you can even say if it's somewhere between, say, like body weight and 1.3, 1.5 times body weight, somewhere in there. Yeah. If you're failing in that ballpark on your squat, then like it's probably a mental issue. And it could also just be a I'm not eating issue. I'm not doing the right things. Those other important questions that we've talked about. 
before. It's interesting that you said, I've never thought about what you just said, which is most of these people, the vast, vast majority of these people that struggle with this are people who work for a living and their mind is the most important thing in their occupation. I don't know that I've ever, ha I've trained lots of people, like lots of construction workers and furniture movers and farmers. Oh. And none of those guys have a problem. Those guys get it. It's, I've never had a roofer nope. who failed their squats at 145. Because there is a, by the way, you ever roofed a house? You ever work like land? Yes. Hey, that's a terrible job. If you've got a hump 25 square of shingles on the roof. That's right. That's exactly right. And there's 14 more bundles and you're done. You're not done. You got to get them back that's up right. there. And you go and you throw, you drink a little water and you throw another one over your shoulder and you climb that damn ladder and they get it. Yeah, and you're doing it in August and you're on the roof. So you're above the trees. So there's no shade. It's super hot. The heat's coming off those asphalt shingles and you're just like, and you just do it. And you just do it. Just reminded me, I had a kid who was one of these types of kids that you just love in high school was a better than average athlete, but not a great athlete. His family, his dad owned an asphalt company. Like they poured asphalt. Hot asphalt. All summer long. And we'd have our summer weightlifting program and they get up early in the morning because it's so hot, you know? And so they get up early in the morning. They work from like five in the morning to like two in the afternoon. Well, two in the afternoon pouring asphalt on August the 3rd in the Midwest is not, that's terrible. And that kid would come in at 3 p.m., 16 years old, 17 years old, and would lift after working asphalt for 10 hours and you know he was one of those kids that just bought into the program he became an all-state football player and i know i'm saying like he's an all-state football player so you're gonna be like he was an incredible athlete he was not a natural incredible athlete he was probably slightly better than average but it was just he had learned how to work hard how to work hard and i mean physical labor right so again you got these incredible hand surgeons and they're dealing with all these crazy you know like every motor unit fires three fibers <laughs> you know it's not like the hams i mean we're talking about yep. all sorts of nerves and stuff going on but their entire job is their brain and then you put a bar on their back and tell them to bend over and their brain starts to go wait 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 wait, wait, wait. hold on they're relying on their brain there and, and here you shouldn't you rely on the contractile force of your muscles and the process that's right yeah i think that's the main thing yeah. and you just got to do it one of the beautiful things about LP, and we don't really talk about very much, is just how darn safe it is. We talk about, oh, weightlifting has fewer injuries than soccer or, you know, fill in the blank sport. And that's true. And LP in particular is the safest part of all of them of weightlifting. That's exactly right. So weightlifting is pretty darn safe. And then LP is the safest part of that. That's right. Who hurts themselves in weightlifting? Not very many people, but it's people that just go in, just load up the bar and try to jerk a deadlift off the floor and see what they can do. Right. So there's only two groups of people that I think injure themselves on weightlifting. One is ignorant people. I'm not going to say they're stupid. I'm just going to say they're ignorant. They just don't know better. They load up a bunch of weight. We'll see what I can do today. Clearly still a novice. And they just yank on the bar real hard, right? And something like that. And by the way, the injury rate for those people are still really low. And then the other end of the spectrum is the really competitive athletes, the ones that are actually super, super advanced. Those guys tear pecs. They have to take risks. Because they have to take risks because they're pushing. But that LP is so safe, especially when it's under the guidance of a coach. It's pretty damn safe when it's even not under the guidance of a coach. But under the guidance of a coach, you're going to be just fine. So turn your brain off, do the work, punch that time card, and let your body do it. Your body is more resilient than you think. Yeah, so you're going to come up out of the bottom of that heavy squat, and it's going to slow down. And you're going to push. You're going to keep driving your ass to the ceiling until you lock it out. Yep. It's going to get so slow. You think the bar's just, it's not even moving. I'm not even doing anything. It's not working at all. And then pretty soon you're like standing up. And for a third of the squat, you didn't think the bar was moving. But it was. That's right. And then you go watch the video and you're like, I'll be damn. I'll be damn. I could have sworn that was nine seconds. It was a little less than two. That's right. And in the bar, never really slowed down that much because your mind just doesn't know. You drive the hips up, drive your hips up. That's what you do. You know, it's amazing. I, I still struggle with this on a deadlift, especially as I'm starting to ramp up and get strong again. Every time I do a cycle and I start getting strong, my best deadlift 725. Wait a minute. Strength cycle. Sorry, not a drug cycle. <laughs> 
every time I do another strength. There goes Trenolds. Basically, my life works as I get stressed or move. I'm actually recording. This is the first episode we recorded in my new house. We moved to the new house. And so you guys will see like the new studio and stuff once we get everything unpacked and set up. And so um, I moved and then also, but the old house was staged to show constantly. So we didn't cook at home. We can't have a bunch of dirty dishes in the house when it's staged. So man, we just ate out a bunch of food and it just was not very healthy last six weeks. And so I go through these periods in my life where I just basically like won't train or I'll train once a week or whatever for a six week period and things will kind of normalize and I'll get back to training again. And as I start getting strong, so I'll come back and I'll deadlift 400 pounds on my first day back. And then I'll add a little and add a little and add a little and a little. When I get up to about 585, which is, which is really heavy for most of our listeners, but it's still 150 pounds under my PR. There is almost always a day that I'll pull that and it is on the way up. And I set it back down like, whoo, wasn't going to go. And Rachel's like, what happened? Did you hurt yourself? And I was like, no, I'm fine. I couldn't get it. It was too heavy. And she's like, well, it was still going up. And I watched the video and sure enough, even I'll do it, that weight will start going up and I'll put it right back down. Here's the sensation you should be shooting for in the squat. For example, you're going to be driving your hips up and you're going to keep pushing. You're going to keep pushing. You're going to keep pushing through the center of your foot until you lock it out or it hits the safeties. Like if you're still pushing when it touches the safeties, you did all you could do. That's right. And that's what I want from you. The deadlift, you're going to push and you're going to push and you're going to push and you're going to push until it touches the ground again. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, because a failed rep under those circumstances is still good training stress as well. I say it all the time. Your body physiologically does not know whether you completed the rep or not. Yep. If you strain enough and you stress through the middle, stress through that hard part, and you keep pulling or pushing as hard as you can, and then it just doesn't go, and you give it that prototypical five seconds of grind, your body's going to adapt to that whether you got the rep or not. Like it's, you know, it's sort of a mental thing you have to deal with. Like, man, I missed. But your body's still going to adapt. We know that, right? So that's important to understand too. What it's not going to adapt to is hitting those, you know, on that third set of squats, hitting those first four reps easy. And on the fifth one, it starts to slow down a little bit and you just set it on the pins. Well, now there's nothing to adapt to. I didn't stress myself enough to cause a strength adaptation. And so that's why we have to learn this lesson in early to mid LP. Yeah. It's a lesson that must be learned in early to mid LP. Are we working hard enough in the gym? Working hard on that failed rep is good training stress. And we know that we can think about it and realize that it is. But later on, we will actually program missed reps in the form of a press start. So they're very, very useful. In the squat and the bench press are the same. You start them at lockout, you unlock everything, you go all the way down, and you have to come back up. So you have a little stretch reflex at the bottom. That's right. They come out of the hole pretty good most of the time, and then they hit that slow spot, and then it's tough. And you got to really grind. That word is loaded. People think that that's a bad thing. You have to give it your all, you know, a little less than halfway up. You got to give it everything you've got when it's hard. And you got to give it all you've got for a long period of time. It takes time to recruit your muscle fibers. That's right. And so you got to give it everything and then you can lock it out. Now, the deadlift and the press are different. They start at the bottom yep. and they're really, really hard to get moving. All you got to do is unlock your knee and your squat's moving, right? That's right. To start that. So that's easy. The deadlift takes a long time for the meniscus in your knee to squish down all the discs in your back to get loaded up. Like by the time the bar breaks off the floor, you're shorter than you were when you got started. You're compressing a lot of stuff. Sure. It can take a very long time to put your body under enough compression that the bar putting your arms under tension enough that the bar starts coming off the ground. So often the deadlift, you have to be very patient with it to come off the ground. And then there's a spot somewhere under your knee, depending on who you are, where it's going to slow down a whole lot. And that's fine. Your experience of that will be, it's not moving. It's not moving. Oh, my leg's shaking. Let me put it down. No, you let your legs shake and buck. I don't want you humping the bar. There will be a point where you have to have a heavy one in your hands and you involuntarily buck, like your hips shake. It's your hamstrings doing it. And uh, you just stay with it. You keep the bar of your midfoot and you push like your kid is under a car. And then you lock it out. And then you'll be a better person. One of my mentors, Dick Gordon Jr., he's told me this. And I'll tell these guys who uh, are up in their heads and uh, not doing well in the weight room. 
you know, you've got a history of success. If you have a history of a success somewhere in your life, that probably wasn't easy for you to get. And you need to sublimate that into the weight room. So you need to take the lessons that you've learned in achieving the things you've achieved professionally, which weren't easy for you. And you need to translate that into the weight room. That's good. So if you're Dr. So-and-so, you're PE, you're an engineer, professional engineer, or whatever, remember those times when you struggled and struggled and struggled to study for differential equations or that biochem exam or whatever it is, and you had to pull the all-nighters and weren't sure that you could pass, and you thought, you know, well, you just weren't sure about the outcome. Take that part of yourself and apply that to the weight room because you know that good things are effortful and know that you're probably giving yourself every possible excuse to quit, and uh, I don't want you to quit. What else do we want to talk about there? I mean, I could talk about that forever. That's good. You're going to have people listen to this and it's going to change some people and it's going to kind of help reset their perspective a little bit. They're going to, you're going to have some people listen to it and they're just, they just don't have that <laughs> self-actualization at all. And they're going to think that's not me for some, whatever reason, right? It's that snowflake problem. They think that for whatever reason, this won't work, what we're saying won't work for them. And our experience has been that it works for everyone. Yep. If you can do it and push through, it works for everybody. So that's good. There is another Barbell Logic podcast. Um, go listen to our show on embracing the grind. It has some more practical tips on how to get through those hard reps. But this show, I think, is more about the mental thing. It's not necessarily about the grind. It's about trust in the process. And it's about getting out of your head and becoming a physical person, at least for that time. You know, you just got to be a plow mule. When you're in there, you're just an ox. Yep. You're just the dumb ox moving the weight, and that's okay. I think, Matt, I experienced this a little bit early on, that as a guy who was, my driver's license is 6'2 and 143, by the way, when I got it, I was 16. And so as that guy, I associated being big and strong with being dumb and mean. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I think some of these guys that are kind of up in their head and failing, I think that they've got a little of that. Like, gosh, if I have to just like unplug my brain and do this, then I'm going to be one of those guys or they have a negative association with, yeah. with that. They don't want to be yeah. a brute for that time. A dumb meat. Yeah. yeah. And I, sure. I think they, I think they worry about that. I think it's subconscious, but I, I think it's there. Well, that's not what's going to happen. And, you know, so many of the people in high school, <laughs> which is where these associations come from didn't work hard in the weight room. They weren't weightlifters. They were just physically talented people. Yep. And they hadn't earned those physical advantages that they had at that time. That's right. But when you encounter people that have earned those physical gains, you'll find that they are a different kind of person than that one that you ran up against in the hallway your 10th grade year. Yeah, especially when it's done for a purpose of performance increase, strength increase, health benefits and not for the sole purpose of aesthetics, right? I think that, that bodybuilding hurts us some in that you'll still see people who are not in high school, they're 35 years old, and their only goal is just to look great in a swimming suit, right? Is to look great with their shirt off or look great in a bikini or whatever, and that's not who we are, and so that will rub people wrong. I mean, look, I have a lot of respect for the hard work it takes to be a bodybuilder, I really do. Like, it's the hardest of all of the quote unquote, strength sports to do. I really believe that it takes the most dedication. You have to, your entire life is based on it, but that's not who we are. And that's not who we coach. We coach people who live a good life. We try to improve your quality of life. I don't believe bodybuilding improves anybody's quality of life. I believe it actually significantly reduces your quality of life. Like you have to just eat these foods and you have to sleep this much and you have to train this long and the constant comparisons of, you know, taking your shirt off and looking to see what you look like in the mirror. And that's, that's not what we're doing. We're trying to help create people who are strong and healthy and independent. And they've gone through those voluntary hardship type processes, both physical and mental and so it's just a completely different world. And you look at guys like you, you look at guys that, you know, like Brett McKay, or you're not less conscientious from your lifting, right? If anything, you're more. But you didn't lift. The primary goal was not for you to look good when we go to Cancun and you're running around in your Speedo, right? Like it's a byproduct. You do look better in your Speedo. Well, oh, thank you. I personally love the way you look in your Speedo, but that ain't the goal. Yeah, we're not producing big, dumb meatheads that just want to look good and have big arms and be bullies and 
and whatever. And I think there's some of that. I think a lot of us experience that growing up. Remember that everybody looks at me and thinks I'm this big, you know, I got married in 2000 at 170 pounds and I'm six one. I've got my second wind here. All right, here we go. Yeah. Part of this is our fault. Like we've analyzed, maybe overanalyzed every aspect of this stuff. And people tend to come to this with that mindset. Yeah, And they want to go down the rabbit hole on every single rep, but you can't, you've got to do the darn rep. We can talk about it later. We can talk about what happened, but you got to push your foot against the floor as hard as you can. Like you're going to die for three sets of five first. That's right. Yeah. So don't over intellectualize it. Part of it's our fault. And we've done, uh, you know, 200 hours of content of <laughs> nerding out about it. And maybe I'll take some responsibility for some people overthinking it. But, you know, get your bar on your back. Sure. Put more weight on it than there was before and do it or die. Do it or die. That's right. Well, that's why as a coach, the simplest cues work the best. My job is to think about your form and your programming. And then I communicate to you the simplest cue that you can think about one word two words it has to be short because you're stupid when the bar's on your back that's right that's right yeah well there's another show thanks for listening guys <laughs>